Hey, and welcome to the Tuesday live stream. We're going to talk about the book that sparked the movement of street epistemology, which is a manual for creating atheists. We'll be talking about this today, and I'm hopefully going to be taking questions from you guys, specifically from the uh, skeptics or atheists, or even especially street epistemologists in the comments section uh, today. So uh, this is not meant to be adversarial. This is just meant to be reasoning together. Uh, come let us reason together. That's the goal here. So I, I hope you guys can hear me in that tone. That really is, I'm not being uh, disingenuous. That's really my goal here. Um, yes. So here we go. A manual for creating atheists. Um, I think that this manual is actually hurting uh, atheists' ability to reason about ultimate questions. This is kind of a big deal. Like your ability to reason about ultimate questions about life, the purpose of life, God, Christianity, Jesus. Um, some use it very like sort of religiously. They follow it very closely, but many also, they just borrow from this book and from the concepts of this book and they, it sort of trickled down to them. But I think that the pillar issues, the big issues that are in this material are the things that have trickled down. I'm not going to just be critiquing this book, um, in every way possible, nitpicking every single thing about it. Rather, I want to talk about pillar issues, central problems with the whole, um, the whole venture of street epistemology as it's laid out by um, by Peter Bogosian in this book, as it's practiced by guys like Anthony Magnabosco. So hi, everybody. I, I hope you can hear me okay. My, my stuff tells me it's all good, and I don't see any warning signs in the chat. You can put your questions in the chat. Please say, you know, put a Q in there if it's a question, and if you're an atheist or skeptic, put atheist or skeptic there, and then type your question so that we know we can prioritize those. Now I'm going to move quickly, as quick as I can, through this content, and this might be the kind of thing you want to watch again later, but something to think about. Let's consider these these things. Um, so the Manual for Creating Atheists is uh, this book here that um, I've been going through. Me and a few other apologists have been looking at this book and talking about it for a little while now. And it says the purpose of the book on page 15, um, uh, Peter Bogosian writes, is, quote, this book will teach you how to talk people out of their faith. That is the agenda. That is the purpose of the book. Oftentimes, street epistemologists will say, people who practice this stuff will say that that's not really their goal. Um, but that is very strongly, very clearly the goal of Peter Bogosian's book. But he also, in his trainings, he tries, he tells people to hide this. And that, um, I mean, that's deceitful. Uh, but that's not the core issue, okay? That's just so you know. Some street epistemologists will say, Mike, that's not really our goal. I'm saying it's clearly the goal of the book. And he trains people to say it's not their not their clear goal, so that's a problem. Um, it's basically a set of tactics, a series of like a procedure, and it's really simple. It's a procedure that you take people through to get them to doubt the things that they hold dearly when it comes to beliefs about God, religion, and, uh, and sometimes they'll expand this to other things, but the, the general focus tends to be God, religion, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, whatever it is that they believe in. Um, most often I see it used towards Christians, um, and, uh, and I'm going to quote several places in the book. We're only going to be looking at the first couple chapters. If you guys like what I'm doing and you want me to look at some more content from the book, let me know. Put a comment down there. Say, hey, please continue this. It was fruitful for me. It was helpful for me. Um, okay, what is a street epistemologist? Um, according to him, it's a, it's, a, it's a coin term, right? The phrase street epistemology is a new term that he's using to refer to this tactic of someone who goes out into the street or basically they're not... They're not in, in classrooms, they're not in lecture halls, but rather they're going out into the street, into churches, into other locations to talk to people about what they believe to get them to stop believing those things. Let me quote to you from page 15 in his book. He says, the goal of this book is to create a generation of street epistemologists, people equipped with an array of dialectical and clinical tools who actively go into the streets, the prisons, the bars, the churches, the schools, and the community into any and every place the faithful reside and help them abandon their faith and embrace reason. Now that phrase, abandon their faith, is going to be abrasive to people who actually have faith in God or faith in something like that um, because it it's pejorative. Uh, and, and throughout the book, this is consistent. He's always very negative about the concept of faith, negative about people who believe and about their reasons for believing and about the things they believe. But I think that that's part of the goal of the of the book. See, I don't think this book is written for Christians. I don't think this book is meant for Christians in any way, shape, or form. I think it's written for people who are either on the fence or they're non-Christians, and it's gonna 
in my opinion, brainwash them in a few very important ways that will cripple their ability to think clearly about God and clearly about Christianity. And that is why I want to talk about it. So the negative statements about faith, the disdain for faith, the disdain for Christianity, things like that, that's, that's part of the brainwashing that takes place here. And I get this sometimes when I, and I try to engage regularly with non-believers in friendly, honest discussions, oftentimes there is a disdain for the things that I'm holding to be true. And I see it come across in atheist videos online where they'll often misrepresent Christianity with really not even caring if they're misrepresenting it or not. And I think that this comes not strictly from this book, but I think it's expressed in this book and it's, an, it's a serious issue that uh, cripples your ability to think clearly about God. So in chapter two, chapter one basically just introduces the topic, street epistemology, it's only a few pages long, very brief. In, in uh, chapters two and three though, he gets into what he calls the core ideas. Chapter four and, and beyond gets into the actual strategies of how you talk people out of their faith. But chapters two and three are really important. And, and Peter Bogosian tells people, don't skip these chapters. These are core, these are central. And I agree, these are core. In fact, I think that this is where the, um, the pillars you know, of wrong thinking get set locked into the mind of the skeptic who reads this book and absorbs this material and it gets locked into your mind and you're no longer able to think clearly so allow me to explain i know i know this sounds like i'm making bold statements here well I'm, they are bold but i i think they're factual and true and i want to demonstrate it to you um the first thing he does and pretty much the entire uh venture of chapter two is all about redefining terms giving uh, new or 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 selective meanings to words so that when we use these words now we, we have a filter we're putting on the world because we're, we're going to have this sort of narrow meaning of these type of, of these words. The biggest word he does this with is the word faith in this book. It's the word faith. Um, now, I have a whole video on the definition of faith. I've linked it in the description below. I'm not going to get into all that stuff today. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it today. But, um, but there's a whole video, an hour long, going through the text of scripture showing that this definition of faith that Peter Bogosian gives is so wrong. It's wrong from the dictionary and it's wrong from Christian theology. It's just wrong, period. But this is Peter Bogosian's definition of faith. Are you ready? He says, quote, faith is, here's the quote, pretending, um, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead of my own notes. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what he says faith is. Faith is belief without evidence or pretending to know things you don't know. Pretending to know things you don't know. This is kind of a big deal. Faith is pretending to know things you don't know. And this is something he'll repeat as a mantra throughout the book. In fact, there's a chart I'll show you in a minute that comes from the book where he, he tries to reinforce this and tries, I mean, it's, this is brainwashing. I, I want to get you, not like the hard kind where you're torturing someone, but this is, this is, I want to get you to repeatedly think something that's wrong until it gets embedded in your mind and becomes the way you see the world and the way you engage with Christians or um, anybody who says they have faith. So is faith pretending to things to know things you don't know? Uh, no, I can quote lots of dictionaries here. And it's true that there will be a line in the dictionary that says something like belief without evidence. But you have to understand how like dictionaries work, right? There's multiple uses of a single word. You don't just pick one of those uses and then apply it everywhere that word is used, which is what Peter Bogosian wants to do. Um, what you do is you have to actually say, no, sometimes it's just confident trust, confidence. Um, and entrusting of yourself to something or someone, uh, belief in God. You know, there's these different uses of the word, and we have all of them in our English language. Peter wants to narrow it down to this belief without knowing anything or pretending to know things you don't know. Let me actually um, let me actually show you what we're talking about here. This is from his book. There's my thumb. Hey, thumb. He says. When you hear a Christian or someone of faith, a religious person, say that they, quote, have faith in God, you should interpret them in your head as saying, on, you see the second side of the chart, I pretend to know things I don't know about God. If they say life has no meaning without faith, you should, in your head, repeat it back to yourself this way. Life has no meaning if I stop pretending to know things I don't know. If they say I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, then you should hear them saying, I don't pretend to know things I don't know enough to be an atheist. I could go on. There's, there's this chart. It's like three pages. I'm just showing you a piece of it here of, of just list, of, you know, one after another of him brainwashing you about the word faith. He's, he says that if you hear someone say you have faith in science, you should interpret them as saying you pretend to know things you don't know about science. If they say you have faith, your, your spouse loves you. 
you should hear, you pretend to know things you don't know about your spouse's love. If they say, if everyone abandoned their faith, society would devolve morally. You should hear, if everyone stopped pretending to know things they don't know, society would devolve morally. If they say, my faith is true for me, which is a weird thing to say, I agree, but you should interpret them as saying, pretending to know things I don't know is true for me. If they say, why should people stop having faith if it helps them get through the day? You should hear, why should people stop pretending to know things they don't know if it helps them get through the day? If they say, teach your children to have faith, you should hear, teach your children to pretend to know things they don't know. Guys, this isn't targeted to Christians. Certainly not to a, a biblically minded Christian, someone who's learned to think biblically about these topics. Because that's not faith in the Bible, not even by a long shot. And please, if you're going to quote Hebrews 11, 1, please go in the link and click my video and watch it. And there's a link in that video to a whole article on just Hebrews 11, 1, because we care about these things and we think about these things. But if you believe Peter Bogosian's portrayal of faith, then when I tell you that I have faith in Christ, you think I'm making a statement that I have no reason to trust in Jesus. So how can you take me seriously? How can you even consider my, my thoughts and my beliefs seriously? By the way, this is Peter Boghossian. I meant to show you this a minute ago. Um, Peter Boghossian is an American philosopher. Um, he is uh, an, as an assistant professor of philosophy at Portland State University. His areas of academic focus include atheism, critical thinking, pedagogy, scientific skepticism, and the Socratic method. We'll come to the Socratic method in a little bit. Um, he's a philosopher, and for this reason, he should know better. This book, in my opinion, has very bad philosophy, not just in it, but undergirding its very core message. And I think it makes it hard for you to think about God. Um, so what, yeah, what is, what is faith? Well, it's, it's not that. Um, then it's going to come into um, defining atheism. Um, I'm going to make sure I didn't skip something here. By the way, again, you can put your questions in the um, in the live chat, and uh, I have some mods there who are going to help me out, and AJ is going to send me those questions later. I'll be answering them. And stick with me, guys, till the end, because as soon as this live stream is over, I'm going live on uh, Capturing Christianity's uh, YouTube channel, and there's a link in the description for that. And I'm going to go live with John and Cam, and we're going to talk about the series we just finished, the 20... Um, answering 20 arguments against God that we just finished. It was a great series and uh, we'll be doing that immediately after this live stream at, um, well, 6 p.m. my time, whatever time it is your time, in 41 minutes approximately. Okay, he also goes on to redefine not just faith, uh, but redefine uh, atheism uh, and define agnostic in a peculiar way peculiar way. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I, I think I should devote a whole video to this topic sometime, but, but he says, quote, um, he quotes someone rather in his book, quote, uh, I contend we are both atheists. I just believe in one fewer God than you. And this is pretty consistent throughout the book. It's a lot of the sloganizing that we've heard from some of the new atheist movement stuff, which, which upon critical evaluation is just embarrassingly bad thinking. Um, you believe in just one. That's like saying, I believe nothing exists. Um, and then, and then you say, well, I, well, I believe the universe exists. And I go, no, you're pretty much the same as me. You're a nothingist because you see, we both believe all those other universes don't exist. You just believe in one more universe than me or, or, you know, whatever. I can just give example after example of how this thinking doesn't work in real life. Um, on page 27 of his book, he writes that atheism, quote, as, as I use the term, means there's insufficient evidence to warrant belief in a divine supernatural creator of the universe. However, if I were shown sufficient evidence to warrant belief in such an entity, then I would be a believer. There's a problem with this, right? And I've defined faith as pretending to know things you don't know. I've defined atheism as a statement about the evidence, not about my position. There's insufficient evidence. That's how you define atheism. So just by the existence of atheists, it means that there's no evidence for God. This is like not how we think clearly about things. Atheism is position. Like I, 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 I'm of the position that there is no God. Like this is not complicated, but it's being made complicated because it's going to be a battle over definitions because that's what happens when it's about, you know, brainwashing instead of an issue of dealing with the facts. Um, and we'll come back to avoiding facts in a minute. One of his strategies. Imagine if I defined vegan as a person who doesn't enjoy brutality toward an immoral exploitation of innocent living beings. Now, everyone who's not a vegan 
is a person who enjoys brutality toward an immoral exploitation of innocent living beings. This is not rational. No, a vegan has nothing to do with that. Now, it, they maybe, maybe a vegan is right that that's brutality and exploitation, but that's not the definition of vegan. And to stick it into the definition is to smuggle in ideas so that you can like win the conversation without actually having reasons or evidence or anything like that. And this is kind of um, what he does with atheism. Atheism becomes a claim about evidence instead of a claim about his position. Um, now, this kind of s just sucks agno agnosticism into atheism, and this bothers agnostics sometimes that they're being like claimed by atheists a lot of the time. Uh, but he defines agnostic, this is the third word he defines in chapter two. He defines it as someone who, quote, um, agnostics think there's not enough evidence to warrant belief in God, but because it's logically possible, they remain unsure of God's existence. And again, this, the, the, this is making the definition of agnostic about the evidence for God, and that's not, that has nothing to do with it. It's irrelevant. Agnostic, I don't take a position. I don't know if there's a God or not. Easy peasy, man. That's, how, that's what it means. That's what it's been. But we move on. Um, so, in summary, chapter 2, uh, so far, he um, defines faith in a way that's meant to make it irrational. Right? He defines atheist in a way that's meant to include both saying that there's no evidence for God, uh, but also to give the atheist no burden of proof to demonstrate any sort of claims. And then he suggests, in, in the you can read chapter two, he suggests removing agnostic from the table because he's basically stolen a chunk of agnosticism and kind of made this hybrid atheism thing, which is very common nowadays. Um, but a philosopher should know better. And um, this is the stuff you have to do when your position's based on irrationality. That's what it looks like to me. Now, I hope you stick with me. I'm not trying to irritate or aggravate. I'm just, these are, these are statements about facts and reasoning here. And page 28, he says, after triumphantly redefining words so that he has literally redefined reality based upon the definition of these words, he says, now that the terms faith, atheist, and agnostic have been clarified, we can have a meaningful discussion about belief without evidence being an unre unreliable way to navigate reality. Let me translate. Now that I've defined words in a way that make you dumb and me right, I can go on to show you how right I am and how dumb you are. That's all this is. This is not complicated. Now, the guy's he's really smart. I mean, he writes very well. It's clever. It's thoughtful. He uses big words. But it's not reasonable. And you can be intelligently unreasonable. And you can be, you know, stupidly reasonable. <laughs> and the world is full of such people. Um, but this is just intelligently unreasonable. So he's not done yet. In, on page 29, chapter 2, he says, Faith is an epistemology. And this is huge. This is like a central pillar of the book. Okay? Faith is an epistemology. Uh, Peter Bogosian wants you to think that faith is how you come to believe something, not how you hold to those beliefs. Let me quote it to you. He says, A branch of epistemology is, quote, A branch of philosophy that focuses on how we come to knowledge, what knowledge is, and what processes of knowing the world are reliable. In other words, it's the old, how do you know that question? That's what epistemology kind of is, to put it crudely. It's like, how do you know that? 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 Hard questions to answer sometimes, but the epistemology is trying to answer those questions. He says, faith is an epistemology. It's how I come to know things. Well, I've got actually a friend of mine. I have a few friends going to be joining us today. Uh, Tim Barnett from Stand to Reason. Um, he tackled this question, sent me a video today. And I want to play this little clip for you from Tim. I hope I've got the audio balanced. It might be too loud or too quiet. I'm going to try and get it fixed for you if it's not, if it's not good. But uh, this is his response to uh, Peter Bogosian's uh, claiming that faith is an epistemology, which is a terrible and wrong idea. So you want to know what problems I have with Peter Bogosian's book? Well, where do we get started, right? Um, yeah, there's there's a number of issues uh, that I have with his book. Um, probably the main thing, though, is his mischaracterization of faith. And not just the definition of faith, you know, belief without evidence. We could go there, but I have a, a, another issue, and that is how he characterizes faith. And that is he puts it in the category of an epistemology. In fact, over and over again in the book, he says that faith is a failed epistemology. The problem with that is it's not an epistemology at all, okay? Faith is not, the biblical faith is not a way of knowing, it's a way of trusting, okay? And that's why a standard reason we like to use the word trust instead of faith so people don't get confused on this. 
So it's not a way of knowing. This can be demonstrated over and over again in uh, the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Um, for one, look at Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter two, talks about Jesus healing the paralytic. And in there it says, Jesus turns to them and says, so that you may know, no, there's that word, that I have the authority to forgive sins. What does he do? He turns to this paralyzed man and has him get up and walk, okay? So there is, um, there is evidence so they know who he is so that they can now trust him when he says, I can do this invisible thing, like forgive sins, okay? So there's knowledge and trust coming together, okay? But they're not the same thing. They're different, okay? And so faith is not an epistemology. Actually, responding to Bogosian's book, William Lane Craig, who's a philosopher, okay? I have a master's degree in philosophy, but he's a, he's a philosophy professor. He says this, listen to these words. He says, this is so fundamental. This is wa a watershed. He, Bogosian, says that faith is an unreliable epistemology. He wants to make faith an epistemological category instead of a moral virtue. He goes on to say, it is right there that we need to dig in our heels and say that this is a misunderstanding of faith. Faith is not an epistemological category. Faith is a way of trusting something. Faith is trusting in that which you have reason to believe is true. Remember Matthew, Mark, or sorry, Mark 2? He provides the miracle so that they trust. Okay, knowledge and trust. Faith is trusting in that which you have reason to believe is true. So it is once that you have come to believe in something is true using reliable epistemological means that you can then place your faith or trust in that thing. Um, to do so is a virtue, is what William Lane Craig says. So here it is. I, I don't know, this is three minutes now. It's supposed to be one minute. So faith and knowledge are connected, but they're not the same thing. And this is where Bogosian goes wrong, okay? There are different categories. Faith is not a way of knowing. Rather, it's a way of trusting in what you know to be true. All right, take care, buddy. See ya. This stuff is not that complicated. Um, but the thing is this, like, I, I to some, it, everything I say is going to just sound like, oh, it's just pastor preaching stuff. But this is about like logic and reasoning and rationality and just thinking things through. And what we're saying here is, this isn't how you think things through. Faith is not an epistemology. That's just bad. But it's a pillar, a pillar of the street epistemology movement uh, started with um, uh, Peter Bogosian's book. Um, Listen to this. It, go, it gets worse. There's more. I, yeah, I'm going to move forward. So his chief argument in his book, page 30, this is what Peter Bogosian says. He says, I'll briefly explain what I find to be one of the principal arguments against faith. Principle. This is number one, right? If a belief is based on insufficient evidence, then any further conclusions drawn from the belief will at best be of questionable value. Believing on the basis of insufficient evidence cannot point one toward truth. Um, so he's saying that I define faith as belief with no good evidence, no reason. And then I go, hey, what do you know? If you have faith, then you should stop because I've defined it as being uh, belief without evidence. And now I'm calling it an epistemology. These are two pillars that are both false, factually false, that this stuff is founded upon. And it's, it's, not, it's not tripping me up. It's tripping you up if you're the skeptic that's swallowed this stuff. This is just wrong thinking. Um, he goes on and on. I want to say thanks to Tim, by the way, for helping me out and uh, sharing that content. Really good stuff. Um, okay, he finishes chapter two with the dangers of faith. And that's what he'll get into in chapter three as well. It's, he just, he's, it's just an all-out assault on the concept of faith or trusting anything, for that matter, it seems. Um, these, these examples of the dangers of faith are like strung together examples of things people do in the name of religion that Bogosian hates. And it would basically, if I was reading this and I were the skeptic, perhaps not super aware of these things, I would think, man, yeah, religion is the cause of all the evils in the world. Um, but I could give an equally long list, in fact, longer list of things that people do that are wonderful and that are as a result of their faith, even in my own life, as well as the lives of those around me, as well as historically. And it's, it's just, this isn't good reasoning. It's not good thinking. In chapter three, Bogosian gets into what he calls doxastic, uh, doxastic closure, belief in epistemology. That's the title of the chapter. 
but ultimately it's just more brainwashing about faith. And I'm going to quote to you a few of the things he says about faith. And then I'll quote to you how he's going to romanticize street epistemology because it's going to, he's going to put these two, like the street epistemologist is at war with those, with faith, not those people who have faith, but they're at war with faith. They want to destroy faith in the, in the heart of a person. And um, that's according to Bogosian. Um, some take a much more gentle approach, um, but that's, this is the, start, the, the kickstarter of the movement right here. So here's what he says about faith. And then he'll, I'll read what he says about street epistemology and how he romanticizes it. It's like the most beautiful thing in the world. It's lovely. You should kiss it and hug it. All right, page 43, he says, faith taints or at worst removes our curiosity about the world. What we should value and what type of life we should leave. Faith replaces wonder with epistemological arrogance disguised as false humility. Like, this is just propaganda. Like, this isn't true. Do I have to demonstrate that this is not true? This is silly. Page 44, he says, The street epistemologist seeks to help others reclaim their curiosity and their sense of wonder, both of which were robbed by faith. Like, I have a lot of faith in God, in Christ, in the scriptures, in Christianity. I have a lot of faith. It has not robbed me of any wonder or curiosity in the world. In fact, a lot of my intellectual pursuits have been driven by the fact that I believe the universe is the way it is. I think the universe was made by a genius. I think that it has purpose and beauty for me to discover. I think humans are amazingly made and worth attention, relationship, and honoring. There's a God, and you think that removes the wonder that I would have or the curiosity that I would have or the questions I have about value it spurs them all forward a hundred times more on the other hand like if I were an atheist I would be a nihilist because I think logically that's the conclusion of atheism no morality no purpose no genuine beauty no no real love no personhood no free will no nothing lasts no meaning I mean there goes the wonder that's that's on that worldview. That's not because I'm mad at atheism. That's just a consistent worldview. At least that's as I understand it. If I'm wrong, uh, show me I'm wrong. Uh, it's not a personal attack here. So the second side, first side is demonize and mock faith and misrepresent it utterly and completely at the foundational nature of what it is. And then second, romanticize atheism. Romanticize atheism and doubt and make it as pious as possible. And I'll give you some quotes. Page 44 of his book, he says, the street epistemologist seeks to help others reclaim their curiosity and their sense of wonder, both of which were robbed by faith. I read this earlier about faith, but now think of what he's saying about the street epistemologist. Oh man, you're like, you're the hero, guys. You're saving the world one person at a time by helping them get rid of the faith virus, as he likes to call it a faith virus. Page 45, as a street epistemologist, one of your primary goals is to help people reclaim the desire to know, a sense of wonder. You'll help people destroy foundational beliefs, flimsy assumptions, faulty epistemologies, and ultimately faith. I mean, but the street epistemologist never goes out and says, hey, can I talk to you? Yeah, sure, what for? Well, I, I want you to help rediscover your sense of wonder because your belief in God has totally destroyed your sense of wonder. And um, yeah, your flimsy assumptions, we got to get rid of those. Like th that's not how it comes off, but that's here at the foundation of it. Page 45, he says, helping rid people of illusion is a core part of street epistemologists project and an ancient and honorable goal, disabusing others of warrantless certainty and reinstilling their sense of wonder and their desire to know is a profound contribution to a life worth living. I mean, does, does believing in Christianity really kill my desire to know things? Does it do it for you Christians? Do you not want to know things because you believe in God? Is Really? This is just weird, because, but it's not for me. It's not for Christians. It's for atheists to get them to marginalize and to have a filter through which they view the religious. The religious, they have a disease, a virus called faith. It robs them of a sense of wonder. Gosh, I'm morally obligated to help them get rid of that thing. That's, that's the brainwashing. Throughout the book, there is an assumption that religious people have not really thought through the things that they believe, and if they did think them through, they would reject them. That's kind of an assumption that goes throughout the book. Of course, guy, you know, guys like me exist doing the things we do because I've thought it through, and I think I have good reason to believe. If I didn't, I wouldn't have this channel. Um, you can say I'm, I'm, I'm incorrect or something in some respect, but the concept of this book is, is um, it's like a, talk about a straw man. It's embarrassing. Um, at one point, I, I think this I should point this out, he contradicts himself on faith a little bit. In page 45, he quotes David Hume, um, who said, quote, 
a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. See, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like I believe that. A wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. If I have good evidence for that, I should believe it. I should trust and I should proportion my belief to the evidence. I agree with you there. Um, but then he goes on in the next sentence, Peter Bogosian, his commentary on this quote is this. It would seem to follow that someone's faith couldn't possibly be moved by reason. What? Yeah. This is not about faith. This is not about Christianity. This is about brainwashing people. Not torturous brainwashing, but like a soft brainwashing, getting people to not be able to think clearly about God and religion. So after he gets into the first two you know, chapters and into the third chapter, he starts to get into the tactics, the actual plan of attack that someone's going to have. So I've, I've demonized faith. I've, I've, I've pietized, um, you know, street epistemology and I've done some word jangling and I've got you to think that when someone says, I have faith in Christ, what they mean is I believe in, in Christ with no evidence and for no reason. <laughs> um, and then they get into the tactics. Now, how, what will you do? you go out into the street. How are you going to change people's minds? And, um, the tactics are, first off, first lesson you got to learn is you have to avoid facts. Avoid facts. In fact, one of the guys who pushes this, this movement, probably the biggest uh, guy on YouTube pushing this movement, Anthony Magnabosco, at least that I'm aware of, um, is he goes out and he does this. He's he's going out saying, hey, let's, let's, let's have questions about your deeply held beliefs. And he interviews people and he puts them up on his YouTube channel. Um, one of the things that Anthony Magnabosco will tell you is that you should avoid facts and that you should avoid apologists like this guy right like you should avoid apologists avoid facts don't don't talk about those guys you have occasionally you got the rare street epistemologist who will tackle apologists like pine creek who i've encountered several times he does do a type of street epistemology sometimes he'll say he does sometimes he says he doesn't i don't know what he's saying today maybe he's in the comments section probably not um but uh but yeah the avoid apologists avoid facts thing i just want you to stop for a minute and just be like forget the tactics for a second Think about the concept of avoiding facts. Just think about it. What if a religious person came to you, skeptic, atheist, my friend? What if a religious person came to you and they said, avoid facts? What would you think of that? It doesn't sound wise. It doesn't sound like a good way to come to true beliefs. So avoid facts, avoid apologists, and then ask questions. And that is, in a nutshell, the entire tactic. Be very friendly. Don't tell them what you're doing, right? Don't. Don't tell them about the first couple chapters, right? But just ask questions. And they're going to be, how do you know that questions? Um, hey, uh, so, you're, so you believe in Jesus. Why? Oh, well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, how do you know that? And how do you know that? Great. Good conversation. Have a good day. And it's meant to instill in you a type of psychological doubt. Oh, gosh. I had all these questions. I couldn't answer them all. There's a reason why this is tough. And I won't explain it to you. I'm going to let my buddy John from What Do You Meme? Surprise guest here. Uh, he's he made a video for us as well today. He's going to share with you why this whole asking people hard questions uh, thing can be tough uh, and can be a little disingenuous when it's done in the method that is taught in uh, street epistemology. All right. So real quick, here's just a few of my thoughts when it comes to street epistemology. So um, street epistemologists tend to ask a lot of questions, right? <laughs> so they're just asking questions and asking questions. And I'm all for people asking questions if they're trying to gain clarity or if they're, um, you know, trying to find the truth. But a lot of the times what you notice, and at least in the videos that I've seen, but um, also, too, with, with skeptics in general, they'll, they'll just play like hardcore skeptic where they just keep trying to ask you questions to try to get you to trip up and try to see where you're vulnerable so then they can claim victory. Now, there's a reason why this works. Um, there's two reasons, actually, why it works that I can think of. Um, one reason why it works is because they won't take a position. As long as they don't take a position, then they think that they don't have to apply those same standards towards their beliefs beliefs. Um, so they'll say, hey, I'm just asking questions here. I'm just trying to gain insight. Um, but do you see how that can be seen as manipulative? Um, also, too, what I'd say is that um, a lot of times we may not know the, the source of some of the things that we believe because we haven't traced it back far enough. So, uh, for example, if you just went up to someone on the street and you said, um, hey, uh, what do you believe about George Washington? You know, and then they're like, oh, he's the first president. You're going to say, well, how do you know that? 
They say, oh, well, my parents told me, or I learned from my parents, or I learned in school. They'll say, oh, okay, do you believe everything you've learned from your parents or in school? Or, you know, or I read it in a book. Well, do you believe everything that you've read in books? Has anything that you've read in a book been wrong before? You know, and all, all those kind of things too. So um, when you do that to somebody and you catch them off guard and they're not prepared for it, then they're a little knocked off, right? And so then you give the appearance as if you've actually did something significant, but in reality, you just put a person in a position where they weren't able to articulate um, you know or even probably haven't even thought about before some of the the things that you question about them so um, in some ways I want to say that um, I'm in support of street epistemology when they're asking questions to gain clarity um, but at the same time I see that it also can be seen as manipulative and with that I think that we should take caution all right John just like looks cool no matter what it's like a rule <laughs> anyway um, yeah, thanks, John, for sharing that. I think it's it's good insights, and I want to share uh, now a clip from Cam, Cameron Bertuzzi from Capturing Christianity, who's um, going to help. If you're a Christian and you've encountered the street epistemologist, you know it because they just ask you question after question after question, and he has a couple words of advice for you on that, on how do you like deal with the sense of being bothered by being asked so many questions and not always being able to answer them. Here's his thoughts. Hey guys, Cameron Bertuzzi here with Capturing Christianity. This is one thing that you want to keep in mind when you're talking with a street epistemologist. Seek the truth. When they ask you these questions, sometimes they can sort of throw you off and you don't really know how to answer. But just because you don't have a good answer to one of their questions doesn't mean that Christianity is false or that God doesn't exist. And more generally, street epistemology is not really about seeking the truth. It's about trying to like undermine your reasons for your belief in Christianity. So what you need to do is remember that just because you can't think of a good answer to some type of question doesn't necessarily mean that Christianity is false or or even that your reasons are bad. You know, one of the things that I point out is that testimony is actually a really great reason for believing that something is true. And in the Bible, we have testimony, right? We have these biblical authors who wrote down what they saw, a lot of the, uh, the eyewitness testimony that's in there from Paul. So we have testimony about Christianity in the Bible, and so just believing based on reading the Bible is actually a legitimate answer. Now, beyond that, obviously, testimony can be false, right? So not everyone isn't always telling the truth about their testimony, but as a general principle, we have to accept the testimony of people unless we have reason, independent reason to believe that that testimony is false or unreliable. So then the question would be, well, is the Bible reliable? Is it a reliable method or, or source of testimony? And that's going to be a deeper question that if you don't know the answer to that, then you need to start thinking about it and researching. But asking questions in this little street epistemology game is not the way that you're going to find out whether or not the Bible is reliable or that Christianity is true, or even if your reasons for belief are legitimate. So just keep in mind, seek the truth. Don't get thrown off by these questions. And yeah, all right. See you guys later. All right. Thanks, Cam, for joining me. I'll actually be joining him in a few minutes. So remember the links in the description for our live stream over at Cameron's channel. Uh, me, John, and Cam will all be together. But I got one more clip for you, and this is actually going to be going to be from Greg Kokel. And this is the last clip I'll be sharing with you guys. And um, here's the thing. I like questions, and I thrive on asking questions and trying to get answers for them. But that's the difference between street epistemology and seeking truth we're actually trying to get answers to our questions and we're stopping with answers rather than just ignoring answers and asking more questions. If you hear a street epistemologist ask questions, don't care about your answers, new question, don't care about your answer, new question. That's a, that's, that's a red flag that someone's not after truth, they're after doubt. And doubt is not a virtue. So uh, here's Greg Kokel and he has some things to share about the difference between his book Tactics and this book, the manual for creating atheists and thank you uh, greg for doing this he just threw it together real quick today and i really appreciate it philosopher peter bogosian over at uh, portland state university i think has written a book that's titled a manual for creating atheists and of course his goal is to have atheists read his book so atheists can make other atheists out of religious folk including christians now i have written a book called tactics a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Ironically, 
both of us have written books on tactics. My goal is to get other people thinking properly about the deeper issues, especially about their own convictions if they're contrary to Christianity, and to have a training manual to help Christians to help guide them in conversations with others to consider the truth. There are some similarities between our books. In many ways, I have to tip my hat to Peter Bogosian because he, uh, he is very ironic in his presentation. That is, he's very friendly and diplomatic. Um, he does not want to get into arguments with people. He uh, wants to garden, to use my language, not his. That is, let's do a little bit here, a little bit there. He's telling his disciples to help uh, them uh, have an influence on religious folk and their convictions. All of these things are, I think, smart. And they're all in my own tactics book. There's a big difference, though, between the two of them. Oh, one other similarity is he encourages his people to ask lots and lots and lots of questions. So if you're familiar with the book I wrote on tactics, I call that the Colombo tactic, and there are different ways to use it. But we have very different purposes for our questions. I care about the facts. I care about the truth, and I not only care about the truth, because I think Peter Bogosian does as well. He thinks his view is true, and he cares about that. But I care about how people get there. I want to encourage Christians to be able to use questions in an appropriate way to help clarify what the truth actually is and to get them thinking substantively about that and training ordinary folk, ordinary Christians, to be able to help those who don't agree with them to think in that fashion. However, that is not Peter Bogosian's project. He does not care about the facts one way or another. He, he doesn't want his disciples to be arguing for atheism or against any religious view. He wants them to do just one thing, and that is to cause the people they talk with Use the questions to create psychological doubt. And when you look at the particulars in Peter Bogosian's book, he doesn't always do that in a legitimate way. That is, there are uh, logical fallacies that are involved in his approach, um, and, and almost, I would consider, somewhat abusive, intellectually abusive, approaches that he takes and ways that he uses questions. As long as he can get the other person to doubt what he thinks is false, but doubt it for whatever reason, <laughs> then he's happy. I want people to doubt what they think is false, but I want to give them good reasons why. I want to deal with the issues. So in some ways there are similarities, and in so far as there are similarities, I think his book is virtuous. But the end, or the way that he gets to the end, from my perspective, is a big concern. In fact, I've written a piece in Solid Ground going out the beginning of May to those who received that from Stand the Reason. Uh, and you can get it at str.org. It'll be featured there right after the first of May. It's called Tactics for Atheists. And here I take on the approach of Peter Bogosian and why and how to, how to guard against it, basically, if you're a Christian. And you guard against it by seeing its flaws. And I think it is flawed the way he approaches it. I think his ideas are wrong. Generally speaking, he's an atheist. But I think the way he trains other atheists to go about dealing with it is not virtuous either. It's not intellectually virtuous. And that's a big difference between Dr. Bogosian and myself because I care about being intellectually virtuous at every step of the way. Awesome. So very excited to have uh, Greg Cook will take the time to do that real quick today. Um, and. I hope that this answers a question that might be in a skeptic's mind or maybe someone who's a street epistemologist who's watching this video and they're like, Mike, what's wrong with asking questions? Well, nothing's wrong with asking questions. We, we love questions, but you, you, you shouldn't pretend that that's what this really is. It's using questions. It's not just asking them. It's using questions to instill psychological doubt in people because they can't account for difficult things like how do you know that, how do you know that, how do you know that, dialing it all the way back. Well, even philosophers struggle with some of that kind of stuff. And uh, we should be going for truth, not questions. That's the thing. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why street epistemology has become so attractive and why so many people are ready to read 
three pages of this book and then just go start doing it is because his avoid facts tactic. I'm just going to ask questions, try to get you to doubt, and then move along. That's it. I just want to instill psychological doubt in you. That's all. I'm, my job is done if I get you to just question what you believe. And that's the general view of things. And you know this if, you, if you've encountered people who use this tactic. It feels like you're being manipulated because you are. But guess what? The street epistemologist who's manipulating someone else by asking them questions has first been manipulated. That's why they're doing it in the first place. And that's what I wanted to make this video about. Now, I asked you guys um, for questions. A couple times I said, hey, we're going to prioritize questions from atheists, skeptics, non-believers. Um, I got one question from a non-believer. We got 300-something people watching live. I got one question from a non-believer. I'll read it to you guys here from Insects Are Cool, who she's been following my stuff for a while, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, she says, I don't have a challenging question this week, so I'll just ask you if you have any book recommendations besides the Bible for atheists. Um, I think Josh McDowell's Reasons is a really good book. Um, also, More Than a Carpenter just came out with a whole new copy, a new like updated edition. Uh, Josh and Sean McDowell work together on that. So maybe More Than a Carpenter, the new edition, I think that would be a great thing to check out. That's the only question I got from non-believers. I thought street epistemology was all about asking questions. That's it. I know that this video has street epistemologists watching it. And I, and I know that when I tweeted out, I'd be taking questions from atheists. That was shared by street epistemologists on Twitter. Where are you guys? Like I just, you've been brainwashed. Your tactics, while they have elements of, that are really good in them, it's the other stuff that's undergirding it that's just something's wrong there, you know? Um, I'll take a couple of questions um, and for about five more minutes, and then we're going to sign off because I'm going to be heading over to um, Capturing Christianity's channel. Again, the link's in the description for that, and I hope you guys will join. And there will be a chance for you to ask questions there as well, and I hope that people come and they ask questions, good ones, tough ones. We enjoy that kind of stuff. We love questions, but we also love answers. Um, so our wholesome home says, uh, what do you say to your young child toddler if they ask, Mommy, am I a child of God like you? Um, Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I don't have a toddler, so I haven't really wrestled with at what age you can tell someone yes to that. I mean, uh, I would just be teaching him doctrine, teaching him. I mean, think of it this way: if if you're, this is off the top of my head now. If if your child is 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 at such a young age that they're not able to be held accountable for these things, well, then the answer is yes. They're 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 saved through lack of accountability, in a sense, covered by Christ. At least that's my understanding of theology. I should do a video on that one day so I can substantiate it with scripture, but um, to the best of my ability. Now, if they're at an age of accountability, then that's a great time to give them the gospel to ask them to respond. Um, that's the best answer I can give right now for you, and I hope that it, it's somewhat helpful for you. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more. You should ask a ask someone who has kids. <laughs> Search for Truth says, um, how does Hebrews 11.1 1, uh, form your definition of faith? I think that the short answer is Hebrews 11.1 1 is a description of faith, not a, de not a definition of faith. Um, so think of it that way. It's, uh, it's describing how, what faith looks like in the life of a believer. And then it gives a list of people who did things by faith. They, notice they didn't believe things by faith. They did things by faith. Like by faith, Abraham offered Isaac. Um, by faith, Noah built an ark. So there's these activities they did that demonstrated that they really believed. So this is what faith looks like in the life of a believer. Uh, that's the short answer. But on, um, on the video I linked down below where it has uh, the description of faith, click, click that video. In the, in the description of the video, um, there's a link to a Standard Reason article which Amy Hall wrote going into great detail on Hebrews 11.1 1 and the definition of faith. So I would recommend you check that out. Um, Mariano Rogers says, Mike, uh, Matt Dillahunty likes to call God a moral thug on his show, The Atheist Experience, can you press him on this in your debate and show him the ignorance in that position? Uh, Mariano, that would be a really good thing to talk to him about, but because the debate's about the resurrection, I'm gonna stay focused on that topic, and the issue of morality gets will, will overtake the discussion, and it would be kind of a red herring for me to bring that up in the debate. Um, but it, it is irrational to call God a moral thug for several reasons, especially if he's the grounding for morality, then that's that's like saying blue is anti-blue. It doesn't it doesn't logically work in the Christian worldview to say something like that. Um, 
Zenshi asks a question. Uh, I don't understand why God allows people to be to become or be born severely mentally ill and where they cannot understand anything. Do they get a chance to accept Jesus? Or are they just unlucky? Um, I've dealt with this in a video in a little bit more detail called What About Those Who Never Hear the Gospel? And, the, and that's the title of the video, so you can Google that it, or search on YouTube. It should come right up. What about those who who never hear the gospel? Meaning in their entire life, they never hear it. And I go through a lot of scripture. I'm trying to build a biblical case for how we should view that question. It's kind of in depth. But I think that God holds us accountable for what we what we, what we we can know, what we, what we did know, and how we did respond. Um, I do think that mentally ill people still have to deal with issues of sin, and they still need the blood of Jesus Christ. But mentally ill is a very broad category, right? There's some people who are mentally ill who have much more capacities than someone else who's mentally ill. And so it's hard to give a blanket answer to a question like that. I'd recommend you um, you check out that video. Uh, JMD Apologetics. Uh, hey, JMD Apologetics. He says, uh, does faith by nature seek understanding? If so, then would this not be a way of receiving knowledge of God? I don't know that I... Uh, forgive me, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Does faith by nature seek understanding? I think faith is it's, it's more simple than that in my opinion faith is simply a position of trust right when i when i say i i believe god i, tr I have faith in god i'm choosing to trust these things about god i'm trusting um does trust seek understanding it you you can or you don't it's up to you how do you deal with this stuff um i hope hopefully you seek understanding but uh but yeah um if so would this be not be a way of receiving knowledge of god um that's probably a more complicated question than I'm able to answer, to be honest. Okay. Hey, um, I still can't believe we didn't get, still haven't get any questions from, from the skeptics, at least that I was sent from uh, AJ. I don't see them in the comments. Um, here's one from Big Idea Seeker. Okay, I see one. Have you read Randall Rouser's In the Atheist? Is the Atheist My Neighbor? If not, would, uh, would you? If I bought it for you, the STR guy needs to read it too. Um, that is such a kind offer to, to give, you know, give me a book to read. Unfortunately, I'm like up to here with books to read right now and people have been sending me books and I, I regret that they send them because I'm like, they spent all that time and money and sent me this thing and I'm not able to read it right now because of my schedule. So um, you, I'd, be, I'd love for you to send it to me. I, have, I don't know when I'd be able to actually get to it. So there you go, big idea seeker. Um, okay, I guess we don't get any questions from skeptics. So there you go. That's kind of ironic. If you guys want me to do more on street epistemology um, and look more in this text, because there's a ton more he gets into in here, including where he actually tries to tackle apologetics, um, then let me know. Like the video, share it. Like if this video performs well, it's like confirmation to me that this is worth spending time on. And if it's helped you overcome perhaps someone creating psychological doubt with questions, not answers, then that's, uh, that's a huge blessing. Maybe you can let me know down below. Go to the link in the bottom there and we'll... Um, uh, okay, I'm just reading the comments. <laughs> I, SJ, hi SJ. She says Anthony Magnabosco is here. Hi Anthony, I, I talked about you today and I'd love to give you a chance to share something. I'll wait a moment and see if you have something to type into the chat and I'll share it with everybody. Um, and I'll watch if anybody wants to make a, a, another video reviewing my video and commenting on it. I'd love to hear it. Hear what you think about those things. I think that there are substantial points about the problems of this book. If you have a different method of street epistemology that openly rejects the bad reasoning in this book I'd love to see it but not one that ignores it uh, that's not what I'm interested in personally so thank you guys for joining me um, I hopefully I've given you some good stuff to think about and more than anything else I want this to be like a wedge in the door that gets you to think more clearly about Jesus and the fact that he has died on the cross to pay the price for your sin because God loves you and he wants you to know him and he wants to forgive you and sometimes this stuff is just false intellectual barriers to keep you from thinking about the gospel. Thank you so much. Have a great day.